Now yeah. what you're going to see is you're seeing this little interim part where where the markets are enjoying this pullback in the US dollar, but there will be a tipping point where the US dollar starts to go lower and lower and lower and it's going to start to freak out the markets. And the reason why it's going to be bad for stocks is that the dollar going lower is going to signal a start of a bad recession and it's going to be a recession that looks to get worse and worse and worse. And in those periods the dollar will go lower um and that will actually hurt stocks in that situation and it'll hurt stocks because if you have a bad recession well guess what apple selling less iphones right yeah. you know microsoft selling less this and that so they're going to make less money and their multiples will have to come down after the cryptocurrency market had lost 165 billion dollars from its market capitalization in a week bitcoin dropped below $20,000 and is still struggling to pull itself back above that threshold back in january 2022 Soloway projected that the cryptocurrency sector might experience a dot-com moment soon, but also predicted that Bitcoin could trade at around $100,000 or $250,000 in the next five years. In a recent interview, chief market strategist of InTheMoneyStocks.com Gareth Soloway tells us all about his latest analysis of the charts, as well as his predictions and price targets for Bitcoin and gold. In his opinion, he still believes that Bitcoin might drop further. He is also a proponent of crypto regulation believing that it would be a positive thing for Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general, as institutions would feel more confident investing their clients' money in them. Before listening to him, please ensure to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. The earth-shattering kind of event that Lehman Brothers was in terms of shaking the industry to its core, and I think you've seen that in crypto. I mean, this is really the big earthquake if you're looking for one. And then what you're looking at also is is how does the the crypto market come out of this? And and one of the interesting things when you look at how an exchange an exchange in crypto is virtually the same as a bank is in the economy, right? So you know the banks obviously lend, they they give you leverage, they give you all these kind of things to do. Well, that's what the exchanges do essentially. So so there's a lot of similarities in what they are and ultimately how they failed, right? Lehman Brothers took risks that they shouldn't have taken. They leveraged themselves up way too much. FTX did the same thing. So there's a lot of those similarities. And then you look at things like the charts and you start to say, okay, did the market bottom when, it, when Lehman Brothers collapsed? And the answer is no, it took about five to six months to bottom. So you start saying, okay, if this is a Lehman Brothers moment, when does this give us? Does this finally give us that timeline when crypto could bottom? And I think it does. And I also think that if you look back to the 2008, 2009 period, you saw these banks misbehaving like a lot of these exchanges are, Celsius, Voyager, and now FTX. And you saw regulation come out of it. What was it? It was Dodd-Frank, right? So, so you have that functionality, which is now likely going to come out in the crypto markets. And so, again, what I did was I looked at the charts and I said, okay, well, when Lehman Brothers occurred, how long did it take for, for the markets, the S&P to bottom? That was five to six months. And then I also looked and I said, okay, well, what type of fall did we see following? In the following five to six months, how much did the S&P fall? The answer is about 40 to 45%. So wow. if you take 40 to 45 percent away from the current levels on Bitcoin, it puts you right around nine thousand dollars as a potential low. And, and, and in all fairness, I mean, I understand that perspective. Um, I think that it's somewhat misguided because, again, number one, Ponzi schemes are a little bit different in their functionality. But I think also you look at the U.S. dollar and who's to say that that's not a Ponzi scheme. All we do as a country is borrow, borrow, borrow to repay debts that we have. And it's kind of just repaying, repaying, and just we just borrow more to do that. So in many senses, you could say the U.S. dollar and the U.S. economy is built that same way. But the key is that that Bitcoin is now being adopted by more and more people. There's big money involved. I think FTX is a major issue because it really creates mistrust in the crypto yeah. industry. But again, from mistrust, regulation will come, which will create transparency. And once you have transparency, that's where real trust is built, right? I mean, before this, we didn't have transparency and we were just hoping that everything was fine. 
but we know and now that's not the case. And so you have that transparency that comes from regulation, and that's what's going to drive big money to invest, in my opinion, in Bitcoin and in Ethereum. Uh, I think what people are discovering and what's interesting is, you know, I, I've been saying for well over a year that we needed regulation in the space. And again, the key thing is you just need common sense regulation. Now, whether our politicians can actually come <laughs> up with common sense, I would doubt that. But the hope is, and you have to look at it like this, right? Is is it better to have no regulation and then people doing what Sam Bankman Free did and mismanaging, you know, client funds and over leveraging and, and basically people losing fortunes or all their money? Or is it better to have some regulation in the space, maybe a little too much just because our politicians generally do that, but is it better than nothing? And for me, I'm an investor, I wanna make money, right? So for me, the, the deregulation, or, or I should say the decentralization isn't as keen of a point as whether or not Bitcoin goes up. Listen, if Bitcoin goes to zero, it doesn't really matter if it's decentralized or not, right? You yeah. have to have the foundations of trust and you have to have rules and regulations to do that. So my hope is that the government doesn't overregulate. Um, I think that for the most part, gold, uh, or I should say Bitcoin is the digital gold and that will create its own kind of intrigue once we get transparency in, this, in the system. But I think when you look at Bitcoin, like weirdly enough, if you don't get regulation, I think you could argue that cryptos will eventually go to zero, right? Because think about this, after FTX, and you had a bunch of big money, I mean, Tom Brady, Giselle Bunchen, um, you know, uh, you know, Kevin O'Leary, I mean, all of these big players were involved in FTX. And now everyone saw that that blow up. And there's no sports stars, there's no celebrities, there's no big money that is willing to go near any crypto anymore until wow. they have some sort of transparency because it's not worth their fortunes. It's not worth their reputations now, right? You have some major tarnishing on reputations. I know there's lawsuits being filed and all that stuff. So so the question is, is are there enough small investors to really create that push in Bitcoin to have it go to 100,000, to have it go to a million dollars? And again, I don't know that. And, and I think that's my biggest concern is that without that transparency, without that re regulation, you're not going to lure the big money in that can really drive it to the upside. So that's such an interesting thing, because in reality, it's probably smarter for the central banks to kind of clamp down and the politicians to kind of just get rid of it. Because then you only have one option, the U.S. dollar. I mean, you can say gold, you know, other currencies. But this is the beauty of politicians. They all want to get votes right? It's all about doing what's popular. And right now, the popular thing that's going to get them votes is to get regulation and transparency and make it so a lot of their constituents don't end up losing money in the future, right? They want to be seen acting like, oh, people got hurt. All right, how do we act and make ourselves look good? And that's the beauty of it. So the in a weird way, if, if politicians were farsighted, meaning they looked really far out, they would probably get rid of Bitcoin and get rid of crypto. But they're also micro viewpoint, right? They all want to get reelected in four years here in the US. And that's one of the reasons why I think you get Bitcoin to stick around, you get crypto to stick around. And actually, it actually helps the crypto case here. You know, so number one, I think that there's a lot of politicians that secretly have crypto holdings. I know some have said they do, but I think it's more than we realize. Um, mainly because they're on the cutting edge of knowing what's going on. They see the revolution out there. They see what the blockchain is going to be. They understand some of these big money players getting in. And I also think that, you know, you look at places like Texas in the U.S. Texas is, is a massive place where there's there's um, there's mining going on. There's there's huge amounts of jobs based on the on the blockchain. So Texas being a huge state, you have a lot of politicians just there alone that are pushing for good quality regulation and they want the blockchain they want crypto to survive. So you can go to other states as well, and it's really starting to spread. The crypto market, you know, in terms of the economy is, is exponentially growing year on year. It's still relatively small, but it is it is growing bigger and bigger. Like look at things like Microsoft, um, other companies out there, they've already launched side businesses or incorporated crypto and blockchain into things that they're doing, which is now becoming more and more dependent on that blockchain. For all I know, my the places I have my money could be gone tomorrow. But like something like a Coinbase where it's a publicly traded stock, I would hope that the SEC is a little bit more involved there. Um, so it's a little safer. Uh, I hear Kraken is audited twice a year. So, I mean, you know, there, there hopefully are exchanges that, that are better quality. But again, 
in this environment, nothing is 100%. We have to understand that. There's no FDIC insurance here in crypto like there is in stock accounts where the government guarantees your money if it vanishes. And so people just have to be aware of that. And so cold storage is definitely one way to do it. Um, because I'm more of a swing trader, I don't do that, but I definitely limit the amount of money that's on the exchange. And you said before, Kevin O'Leary was involved with FTX. He's one smart guy. He's Mr. Shark Tank. Yeah. He got caught yeah, as well. Yeah, he was, I mean, there, you have, there's clips of him just praising as, as Sam Bankman Freed, right? So, I mean, it just shows you that that no one's immune. And, and part of that is human nature where there's greed that comes involved. But also, I mean, it's very hard to spot these things. Like, think about, and I, and I bring this up, we talked about how Lehman Brothers is very, you know, connected in a weird way to the FTX. But you could look at Enron. I mean, Enron operates operated for years doing basically fraud and no one caught on until the market finally collapsed in that area and then they couldn't hide it. Um, you know, you look at some of the other players, WorldCom or or Bernie Madoff, right? And as long as the, the economy and the market was doing well, Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme could be paid off. He could just pay anyone who wanted to get out with new money. As soon as the market crashed, or got got real weak, he couldn't do that anymore. So, so I mean, this is the thing: is it's very in, in bull markets, shady players can hide things very easily, and even even the best of us can get fooled. There's no doubt about it. The gold price has kind of been hovering around. There's still people turning around saying, "Well, they're not that interested in gold." But actually, at the moment, that possibly should not be. You should be kind of paying a bit more attention. Yeah, I mean, so gold, I, I've been loving the price action in gold. I'm going to bring up my chart so we can take a look here. But basically what we've seen in gold is you, you had this nice little bottom in gold where this kind of this V bottom, this double bottom right down here. Right. I love how in the bottom you hit it here, you retest it, and then it tried to break down again. It tried. It, it tried its hardest. And ultimately it wasn't able to and that's where you got this bullish move we came up to this level here at around 1728 and it broke through and then look at how it retraced this is what i call the scene of the crime so when you break <laughs> resistance here that becomes support resistance becomes support once it's confirmed above and that means that when you hit this point that should be support and we have seen that hold up so i love the fact that we're trading above this 1728 level as long as that continues i'm bullish in the near term and the long term on gold and i think honestly wouldn't shock me to see the dollar having topped out in terms of of on the dxy it wouldn't shock me to see this being a longer term top on the us dollar um you have the fed that likely will kind of taper down its hikes meaning it'll do 50 basis points or 25 then go to zero and then probably be on hold for a while all while the u.s economy starts to really weaken more and more and more and as the economy weakens in the u.s the dollar will start to suffer because it's going to start to price in the fed having to lower rates down the line and again for that reason again that makes total sense why gold is outperforming here in the near term uh, do you think that gold could have another leg down before it strengthens back up again with the uh, with the news of, you know, uh, a bit of US dollar weakness? But could the I'd love your take on a sort of a little further out with the with the gold. Yeah, I mean, so for me, it's it's a matter of right. just looking at the Fed and saying, okay, you know, everyone was worried about these 75 hikes coming and continuing and continuing. And now it looks more and more like that's not going to be the case. So that right there gives a reason why that gold price could have bottomed. Um, and then when you're looking at the chart, I mean, you definitely see that there's some decent support along here. And, and again, the fact that it broke up so solidly is kind of intriguing to me. You could even be starting to form what we would call an inverse head and shoulder pattern here which is a very bullish chart pattern and by i'll just draw it in real quick shoulder head here oh. and then basically you you create this shoulder down here and then you break to the upside so again if that's the case and i'll be watching for this pattern to form gold could be i mean by by december 31st you could be back to in the mid 1800s maybe even close to 1900 if not by early january so are tech stocks on the nose and resource stocks a place to go or do you not like to pick certain sectors? 
No, I, I definitely have no problem picking sectors. And, and what I would say is I still think Apple is way overvalued. I still think a lot of those tech stocks are way overvalued. And what's going to be so interesting is that right now we're used to the market trading inverse to the dollar, right? When the dollar was zooming up, every time it would go higher, the stock market would be under pressure. Now what you're going to see is you're seeing this little interim part where where the markets are enjoying this pullback in the US dollar, but there will be a tipping point where the US dollar starts to go lower and lower and lower and it's going to start to freak out the markets. And the reason why it's going to be bad for stocks is that the dollar going lower is going to signal a start of a bad recession and it's going to be a recession that looks to get worse and worse and worse. And in those periods, the dollar will go lower um, and that will actually hurt stocks in that situation. And it'll hurt stocks because if you have a bad recession, well, guess what? Apple selling less iPhones, right? Yeah. You know, Microsoft selling less this and that. So they're going to make less money and their multiples will have to come down overall. So, so just be prepared for this little flip going on where right now a weaker dollar is nice for the stock market because the Fed's involved. Once the Fed gets to neutral and then we still see the economy cratering, then the dollar will start to fall even with, you know, the stock market. As soon as the market or investors in general realize that the Fed will not come to the rescue as soon as we tick into a recession, that is going to be a wake up call for investors. There's no doubt about it. And, and the, the idea there is that, you know, you, a lot of times what you'll find is when people are most panicked, that's when we're going to get the bounce. But you have to recognize that in bear markets, it's just a bounce, right? So I go long, I go short, I go long, I go short. When I go long, we make money on the move up, but then we're taking it off the table very, very quickly as well. So, so it's about kind of understanding the macro picture and then understanding human psychology. All of that is all combined into what markets and what stocks do. And, and by, you know, it essentially helps us guide people through. There's no doubt about it. And I think, I think the key is here, there are investments that you can look towards. Like for instance, um, gold, you guys know I've loved gold all year long. Um, I said it would be the best performing asset with between the S&P and Bitcoin. It, it obviously was for 2022. I think it will be as well for 2023, although it's a little trickier with Bitcoin now because as Bitcoin gets to a low, you know, it's a little harder to think about, all right, if it bottoms out in June or May of 2023, where is it by December? So it's a little trickier, but I still would go with the safety of gold with the uncertainty in crypto right now. Um, but I also think that there are other places to look like China is actually lowering rates. They just lowered interest rates. It's very risky there, no doubt about it. But I think that that's an opportunity. Um, Brazil looks interesting to me. Their chart is unbelievably coiled. Um, it hasn't made a new all time high for the Brazilian stock market in something like you know, 13 or 14 years. So it's kind of what I expect for the US stock markets has happened in Brazil for the last 13 years, and it could be getting ready to break out. Interesting. Uh, last comment on Ethereum. It's not Bitcoin. It's a slightly different uh, animal, if you like. Uh, it is more contracts based on the blockchain. Is that as affected by, uh, I guess, fear and greed in the markets or is that more stable? No, it, it is definitely affected. I mean, you could argue that Ethereum is a little bit more volatile than than Bitcoin even, right? That moves up and down. It moves up more than Bitcoin percentage wise, but also can drop. But I think the key is here is like, I, I want to know if, if Ethereum is a security, what does that mean? And I don't think we know that yet. So I think the key is the chart itself is does not look horrendous. One of the positives about the Ethereum chart is that the June low has not been taken out yet versus what we've seen in, in Bitcoin. Bitcoin has taken out the June low. So I think that's a small positive. Um, I think that Ethereum will thrive once there's some more transparency, but it's still one of those scenarios where if Bitcoin's going to 9,000, I've got to imagine that Ethereum probably breaks lower and maybe test this $650 level at some point before the bottom is in. But again, longer term, I love Bitcoin. I love Ethereum. You just got to ride the rocky rail here uh, in the near term.